Amen and amen. Thank you so much, choir. Glorious day. Wow, my story. Just a little sneak peek, peek of our Easter musical. Matt, glorious day. Do you, do you remember, if you are saved this morning, if you know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, Lord, you remember that day that Jesus called out your name and that you responded in faith to that great, glorious grace of the gospel. Ran from darkness into daylight. Man, what an exciting day that was, even more exciting yet to come. But folks, understand there's so many people out there, your friends and neighbors and co-workers, maybe in your own family, that simply do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's what it's all about, to be able to lead well, to share the glorious gospel that they might come to faith in Jesus Christ. If you got your copy of God's Word, I invite you to go ahead and be turning the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 11. We're going to look at the first two verses and use those as a jumping off point this morning. Uh, but as I already said this morning, as I say every Sunday this morning, none of us are here by accident or coincidence. Uh, God has drawn us here uh, with purpose and with reason to hear from him, to leave here different change because we have been in his presence. That goes for today, that goes for being a part of Raymond Baptist Church. If this is your church home and you are a member here at Raymond Baptist Church, you're not here by accident or coincidence, you are here because God has drawn you here to be a part of what he is doing. That's exactly what happened with Nehemiah. If you will recall, as we have been going through over these last several months, Nehemiah was comfortably ensconced in Susa. He was the cupbearer to the king, a pretty important job that he had. And when he had received word from his brothers, they came to tell him that Jerusalem was in ruins. The walls had been torn down. They were not able to worship safely in the temple that had been rebuilt. And Nehemiah, sensing God's call, responded to God's call, went to Jerusalem. And in a matter of 52 days, rebuilt the walls around the city of Jerusalem. As we have seen over the last several weeks, those walls have been rebuilt. The temple had been rebuilt, but there were no people that were living in the city to inhabit the city. And so now the process of rebuilding the homes and residences there in Jerusalem. And now we get to a point this morning of where folks need to come back and actually start living in the city. How is that going to happen? And this morning, as we look at Nehemiah's continuing story, just because the walls were rebuilt, uh, just because the uh, houses had been rebuilt, uh, there was still work to do. And indeed, in Nehemiah's day, Nehemiah had work to do in our day as we continue to rebuild the community of faith. Whether that's here as a church, as you rebuild your community of faith, maybe that, that's in your family, maybe this morning uh, you're beginning to build a community of faith, just coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And for some this morning, today is the day that you understand who Jesus is, Savior and Lord, and you receive him into your life, your sins forgiven, cast into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. But folks, this morning, as we think about no coincidences, it's not a coincidence that you are here this morning. It's not a coincidence that you are part of what God is doing at Ramoth Baptist Church. It was no coincidence that Nehemiah would be in Jerusalem to lead uh, the people. If you have your copy of God's Word and able to stand, I invite you to stand as we read uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, the first two verses, and we'll uh, use that as a jumping off point this morning. Now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem. We'll come back to that in a moment. That's, don't miss the, the leader. Who, who are the leaders? Nehemiah and, and Ezra and all of the leaders, the priests and the Levites and the, the governors, all of those that have been listed. Now the leaders of the people, they stayed in Jerusalem. And the rest of the people cast lots for one out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the other nine-tenths remained in their towns. There, there were only so many that the city could accommodate. There were only so many that could move back into the city. All of the Jews that were living in the surrounding countryside, not all of them would actually be able to go back and to live in Jerusalem. And so they had to find a way in order to figure out who was going to come back and live in the city. They cast lots. We'll come back to that in a moment. In verse 2. The people blessed all the men who volunteered. There's that word, volunteered. We'll come back to that as well. Who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Father, we thank you this morning now, for your word. We thank you for now, the life of Nehemiah. And Father, we thank you for uh, just uh, being able to uh, read and study your word. And Father, for your spirit to speak to us through your word this morning. And Father, I pray as we open your word uh, that our hearts and minds would truly be open and to what it means uh, to be called to a particular place in a particular time, to be able to lead well, 
uh, to be able to live well and ultimately to be able to serve well, uh, that we might honor and glorify you. Uh, Father, might your spirit speak and might our hearts and minds truly be open and receptive to all that you are saying. And Father, might we put into practice in our day-to-day life and in the life of this community of faith known as Ramoth Baptist Church. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Folks, this morning we see three things from even these two verses as well as some other verses as we continue to look at Nehemiah as he's rebuilding not just the walls around the city, but as he is helping to rebuild the spiritual community of faith there in Jerusalem among the Jewish people. First of all, we see that we need to lead well as Nehemiah did. Why? Because we lead well because of God's call on our life. God was called to Jerusalem. Nehemiah was called, I think think he said God was called to Jerusalem. He was. God's everywhere. Everywhere, there's no place where God isn't. Nehemiah was called to Jerusalem with purpose and with reason. And once his task was done, once his task was accomplished of rebuilding the walls around the city, Nehemiah said, "It's, it's really not done. It's not finished. There's still more work to do. And indeed, when God calls us to a particular purpose, to a particular plan, there's still yet work to do. Folks, God calls each of us in our lives to lead and to lead well. There's not a single one of us in here that is not a leader in some form or fashion. And you say, well, Pastor, I I don't have the title of leader. Folks, it doesn't necessarily come with a title. There's a a lot of people that have titles of leaders. We look just up the road in Washington, D.C., and we see a lot of people that hold the title of leaders. But I'm not really sure that they're leading well. You can can have the title, but doesn't mean that you lead well. You don't necessarily have to have a title, but you can still lead well. Every single one of us here in this place today is a leader in some form or fashion, whether it's in your home, whether it's at your place of work, whether it's at school, whether it's in the community, whether it's here at church, whether it's just leading in how you interact with other folk on a day-to-day basis, whether you're at Walmart checking out four or five deep, or whether you're at your favorite restaurant this afternoon, We can lead through how we act and how we live our lives and how we speak to others. Every single one of us here can lead someone else well. And the the very thing that we need to do is to make sure that when we're leading, we're leading well because you never know who's looking. You never know who you're modeling that leadership for. You never know that you might be the only person that somebody at your place of work or out in the community would see Jesus Christ flowing in and through. And the most important way we lead is to lead so that others can see Jesus living in and through us so that they can come to the knowledge of a Savior. We have people that are in our spheres of influence, in our families, all, all around us was up with Jacob, my middle guy, on Friday at the the Stafford County Courthouse, and and he was getting his uh, license in in the official licensing ceremony. How how many of you have gone through that official licensing ceremony? Quite a few. And so this is kind of a little bit different, and so you have to go in, and the the sheriff's department kind of gives you an overview, and then they bring in the judge, and here comes the judge, and man, she was just like, okay, I'm going to lay down the law. And she gave three things. She said, you know, whatever you do, Remember these three things. If, if you've got other friends in your car, if people want to get in your, remember these three things. Be really an example and lead by, by these three things. First of all, buckle up, pay attention, and do the speed limit. And I, and I thought to myself as I'm, I'm listening, I'm going, well, two out of three ain't bad. I, I might not have been the best example back in New Mexico for my oldest son because as the judge was saying, she, she said, when? She didn't say if. I like it. She said, when you all appear in this court again. I'm, I'm thinking, of, <laughs> and then it dawned on me. Uh, well, I haven't appeared in your court, but I have appeared in court in New Mexico with my oldest son. And I, I kind of taught him to drive as he's sitting with me, and 
uh, there's a particular uh, street, uh, First Street, that kind of runs into uh, a bypass around the city. And, and at First Street, there's, there's a stop sign. But at 10th Street, there's a yield sign, and you just kind of, and there's a sort of a, an acceleration lane, and you just kind of pull up, and you yield, and you go out, but First Street is a stop sign. Well, I just always viewed the stop sign on First Street when nobody's coming in the direction as kind of a yield sign. And I, I didn't even give it a California stop. We're just talking about yield and go. And so he sat there the whole time. And sure enough, one night after he worked at McDonald's, he got off, and he goes down to First Street, and he does what Dad always did. He pulls up and doesn't stop at the stop sign. It just makes that right turn and accelerates, and he didn't get very far before the blue light started flashing. <laughs> what? You got to, of course, you're, you got to take it. I can't believe you got to take it. Why? So we go to the court. It was a, a teen court. It was a sort of a, a diversionary court. So if you got a ticket, you kind of go to the court. And so he's called up, and I, I have to go up with him. And so we sit there, and the judge begins. And then and they ask Stephen, and is this your dad? Yes. And he, he immediately, I love that, he immediately pulled out the pastor card. My dad's a pastor in a local church. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, part of me sat up a little straight. Yes, I. And well, what did you, well, you know, I, the stop sign, I, I just went through, but you know, my dad does that all the time. <laughs> you know, when, when you get run over by the bus, it's pretty dirty underneath. The, he just threw me right under the bus. But you know, I deserve that. So you never know who's looking. Lead well. Lead well. How, how do we lead well? How are we to lead well, whether that's in our families? How do we lead well, whether that's in our place of work? How, how are we to lead well within the church? How are we to lead well out into the community? Folks, we all have the opportunity to lead well, and it really comes down to this. We must depend upon God. It doesn't matter where we are. I don't care if you're up at the Pentagon or if you're Quantico, if you're in the public school system, if you're in a secular job, you're in a religious job, if you're retired or not retired, you're in the prime of life, you're in school, whether you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, whether you're in private school or public school, it really doesn't matter. We must depend upon God. Because if we do not depend upon God, then all is lost beyond that. We have to depend upon God with three things that we depend upon God for if we're to lead well. First of all, we depend upon His strength. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 at the very beginning of the, the armor of God uh, passage there. The very first thing in Christian Standard Bible, I love the way it says this, finally. So when, I, when all is said and done, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. I love that. Be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Folks, if you're going to do anything and if you're going to lead well, we simply must be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. What does it mean to have vast strength? I, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm guessing with God, vast means pretty vast. More, more than we could comprehend. And it says, that we're going to lead one, depend on God, depend on His strength, His vast strength. Why? Because it'll get you through things that you never thought you could get through. Because there are things in this life that we simply never saw coming and did not anticipate. And I, I will tell you, I, I am a natural introvert. Some of you may have figured that out already. I'm a high-functioning introvert, but I am an introvert nonetheless. And so every time that I get up and preach and teach in a, in a public setting, particularly if I'm not in this public setting, I'm somewhere new, it takes all of God's strength to be able to do what I do. Otherwise, I would just be like, no, forget it. But you, you'll face those things. Some of you are facing those things right now, this morning. Some of you are facing things at work. Some of you are facing things at school. Some of you are facing things in the community. Some of you are facing things with your health. Some of you are facing things with your marriage, with your kids. You know, I, I, I don't know, how am I going to make it another moment, much less another day? If you're to lead well, even in the midst of those circumstances, because won't always be on the mountaintop. Sometimes it'll be walking through the valley. Depend upon God's strength. Be strengthened by him and his vast strength. But 
not only that, depend upon God's word. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. I love that. Think about that for just a moment. We think about Joshua. Man, Joshua was a strong leader, right? Here he is with Moses this entire time. He's kind of Moses' right-hand man through the dead. They could have been in the promised land much earlier if, if they had listened to Caleb and Joshua. Man, we can take this. God's given it to us. But no, the, the people rebelled, and so they began to wander around in the desert for another 38 years, 40 and all. And man, he, right up, and all of a sudden, because of Moses' disobedience, God says, you, you can see the promised land, but you're not going to be able to lead the people over to the promised land. Guess what? Joshua, you're up. And we, we, look at, we look at Joshua chapter 1. Like, man, that Joshua, he was just such a... Can you imagine? Just put yourself in, in Joshua, son of Nun's shoes for just a minute. What? No, no Mo, Moses is your guy. No, Mo, Mo, no, he, he can no. What? I can't lead a million people. Probably at that point, a million plus people leading them across the Jordan River into the Promise. You really? I don't know about you, but if I were Joshua, I might have just, I don't know, had a little bit of anxiety about that. Just a little bit of like, <laughs> no pressure, God. Thanks a lot. I got to follow Moses? Really? But it's in those moments that God knows exactly what we need and what we need to hear. Hear, hear God's word to Joshua. Above all, be strong and very courageous. To observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. He didn't say, you know, just, just act the part. He didn't say, just kind of act. What did he say? He said, if you want to be strong and courageous, if you want to be successful, if you want to lead this people well, and Matt, talk about a million plus Israelites, talk about herding cats. Anybody have multiple cats? You ever tried to herd a cat? It doesn't go well. I speak from experience. You, you, you travel with five cats across the country from New Mexico to, to here, and then you try to take them out of the car, they, they, they still have claws. It doesn't go well. Israelites still had claws. didn't go. God didn't say, just, just act like you know what you're doing. Joshua, you, you, you'll get through. What did he say? Take the word of God. And do not turn from the right or to the left. Depend upon it. Depend upon God's strength. But he says, depend upon God's word. Joshua didn't have all that we have. We have all of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. Folks, when we are to lead well, we must always go back to his word and depend upon his word because his word will never steer us wrong. Whatever leading we need to do, whether it's in our families, whether it's at church, whether it's at your job, whether it's in the community, whatever we lead, we must depend not just upon God's strength, but we must depend upon his inerrant, inspired, infallible word because it is still for us today. It is still active and alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. Depend upon God's word, but notice in verse 9 of Joshua chapter 1, we also get to depend upon God's presence because not only did God say, I, I give you my word, depend upon my word, but he says, depend upon my very presence. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. What? For the Lord your God is with you most places that you go. Yeah. What? Where? Not, oh, wherever. Not most places? That's how we act, isn't it? Most pla God's with us most places. That's not what it says. God will be with, with you what? Wherever you, where's wherever? Wherever. Doesn't matter. He's going to be with you. Jesus put it this way. Remember what I am low. I am with you always. Always. Why? Even to the very end of the age, I'm going to be with you. Doesn't matter whether you're on the mountaintop or whether you're in the valley. Doesn't matter whether you're, you're dealing with things that you knew were coming or whether you're getting hit with that curveball that came out of nowhere. He says, I will be with you. Depend on his presence. He says, I like the great shepherd, I'll be with you. I'll walk with you, even 
when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Fear no evil, for I will be with you. God is a God who promises to be with us no matter what. And nothing, not even death itself, can separate us from his love in and through Jesus Christ. Depend upon God's strength. Depend upon God's word. Depend upon God's presence. Who are you dependent upon today? If God were to pull you aside, he said, are you dependent on me? Or are you dependent on something else? Are you dependent on your own strength? Or are you dependent on my strength? Are you dependent on the, the latest self-help book that can try to get you ahead? Or are you dependent on my word? Are you dependent on my presence? Or are you dependent on somebody else coming around? Well, who are you dependent on today? Might, might it be dependent on God? If we're to lead well, we must depend upon God. But not only do we lead well, but uh, we look in these verses and we see that we're to live well. What does it mean to live well? It's simply this, to discern God's will for our life. To live well is to, to understand what God wants for our life. And most everything that, that we know what God wants for our life is right here. But notice what Nehemiah was doing. He, he moved back into Jerusalem and he stayed. But he needed others to come alongside him. Not everybody could come, but there were some that could, and so 10% would come back, and they cast lots, and so the casting of lots was sort of a practice mentioned about 70 times in the Bible, including in the New Testament and all four of the Gospels. And when Jesus was on the cross, the Roman soldiers were casting lots for Jesus' clothes. In Acts chapter 1, the last time that lots were mentioned, and Matthias was chosen by lot to replace Judas among the twelve. Don't know exactly what lots were. Maybe it was sticks. Uh, maybe it was dice. Not really sure. Probably the, the closest that we come to what casting lots today would be to, to flip a coin. How many of you have ever had to settle something by a coin flip before? I mean, coin flip. I, I, I still re well remember. I, I, I'm not a big fan of coin flips. N not, that I'm, not that I'm holding on to the past. Not that I'm holding on to grudges. But ha anybody ever hear of boy state and girl state? Anybody ever had the pleasure of going to Boy State or Girl State? Well, went to, to Boy State my, between my junior and senior year in Tallahassee, Florida, the capital of Florida. I, I, will have to, I, I thought this is going to be great. I wanted to be an attorney, kind of like law and politics. Man, this is going to be a fantastic week. One of the most miserable weeks of my life. It was just, think about all of the politicians that are up in Washington, D.C. or down in Richmond that are confined to one particular time and place and that you have to swim among them. Well, I thought, you know, I, I'm in my county. I don't remember what the county was, but I'm in my county. Let's say it was Stafford County. They had different counties. and I, I'm going to run for county attorney. And so I ran for county attorney. I'm like, I'm going to be an attorney. And so we had a secret ballot and it came back 30 to 30. 30 for me, 30 for the other guy. You know how they decided they were going to choose the county attorney? They flipped a coin. Can you, can you guess who didn't get to be county attorney? Not that I'm holding on to that. 35 years later, love does not keep a record of wrongs. Not a big flesh, not a big fan of the lots. But you know what? I'm, I'm so glad. That's not how we have to discern God's will today. That, that's, in fact, complete opposite of what we need to do to discern God's will today. For Christians, uh, we're not to cast lots. We're not to, to roll dice. Oh, I know sometimes we'll say, well, maybe I could put out a fleece like Gideon put out a fleece. Folks, I would tell you, that's not the way we're supposed to do it either. We're to discern God's will if we're to live well. And he's given us the ability, he's given us the, the tools to be able to discern his will. Now, the very first thing is that we have the spirit of Christ who lives inside of us. Jesus says, when I go away, I'll ask the Heavenly Father, he will send another comparable to me, and he will take up residence where? Inside of us, and he'll be with us how long? Forever. So we have the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. If you're a believer this morning, if you've been born again, if you've gone uh, from darkness into that glorious day, as the choir sang about just a moment ago, the moment that you responded in faith when Jesus called out your name and you went from darkness to light and you became a child of the King. I was going to say, guess what? But there's no guessing. The Holy Spirit of God took up residence 
your life. Amen. That's good stuff. Because it's not like he, God is everywhere, but the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in your very life. You have the Spirit. You've got something much better than lots. You've got much, something much better than, than trying to, to pick the shortest or the longest stick. You've got something much better than rolling the dice. You've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Talking about the Spirit of truth that will guide you into all truth. Wow. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 speaks at length about that. I, I won't spend time this morning going over all of those, but just the last verse there, 15. The spiritual person, the spiritual person is who? The spiritual person, the one that has the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them, can evaluate everything. Yet he cannot, himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. But we can evaluate, why? Because we have the Spirit of the living God. But not only that, we have the mind of Christ. Look, look in verse 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. If you've got the spirit of Christ living inside of you, you have the mind of Christ as well. And the mind of Christ really can only be determined by the word of Christ. We've got the word of Christ. Might it, might it dwell in you richly? Might, might you take this in? Folks, for today is a day of God's word. It's not something just for yesterday. It's not something for 2,000 years ago. God's word is for today, for the believers, so that we can discern what God's good and perfect will is. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Uh, often we might say, WWJD. What does that mean? What would Jesus do? Well, golly. I really wish I knew. What would he do? I, I just that's a that's a head scratcher. I really I can't quite figure out what Jesus would do. Well, yeah, you can. It's right here. It's not a mystery. This is not this is not gibber. God's given us his word to understand. God's given us his word to, to comprehend. God's not spoken to us in gibberish. God has spoken to us coherently, rationally logically we hear that word we talked about it wednesday night we hear that word logic folks aristotle did not invent logic the greek philosophers did not invent logic and reasoning that all came from god himself god is logical he is rational you look at the universe and see how he put it together to understand this is a god uh, of rationality and logic and he has given us his word what would jesus do well pick up god's word and find out what Jesus would do. And by the way, if you say that Jesus told you to do X, Y, and Z, and it conflicts with God's word, then you can be sure of this one thing, that it was not God who told you to do X, Y, and Z. Because God's word, inspired by God's spirit, will never contradict God's spirit when he speaks into your life today through prayer, through circumstances, through the counsel of other Christians. It will never contradict God's word. Folks, WWJ, what would Jesus, how, how am I to, to live well? We live well because we follow, the, and this is not a word, but I'm just going to, we follow, follow the wellest example that we can. The most perfect example that we can. In, in fact, the only perfect example of what it means to live well is Jesus Christ himself who lived a perfect, sinless life for sinners like us that he might ultimately go to the cross of Calvary and there die on the cross for your sins and for my sins and the sins of the world. He lived a perfect life. He lived well. And if we're to live well, we need to live like Jesus lived. And God's word is the only way that we know how Jesus lived well. Take this in. Study it. Meditate upon it. Listen to it. Hear it. And at the end of the day, do what James says that we're to do is not just hear it, but put it into practice. We are to lead well. We are to live well. And if we do those two things, we will ultimately serve well. Notice, if you will, at the verse 2 of Nehemiah 11, the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Don't miss that. 10% were, were cast lots, and they were able to move back into the city. But before they moved back into the city, even though their lot was cast, they still had to volunteer and say, I, I accept the assignment. You see, folks, serving well relates to choice. And God has given us a choice whether or not we will serve 
and whether we will serve well. Now, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. Pastor Chuck and I were talking about this a moment ago. Uh, before sir god is sovereign and he could supernaturally heal people if he so chose to supernaturally heal physically but you know what god could also choose to heal through doctors and nurses and through medicine it's up to him it's not up to us it's up to him god can choose that we serve and can offer opportunities for us to serve but if he so chose he could have us do whatever he wants us to do even if we don't feel like even if that's against our will why because he's sovereign Now, God typically doesn't work that way. God typically gives us opportunity and gives us freedom and gives us choices. And the choice this morning before us is to serve. And serving is a choice. And so if we're to serve, serving God requires commitment. It requires commitment on the part of these people who would move back into Jerusalem. They had to volunteer to move back into Jerusalem. Folks, we must volunteer. That's why we call for volunteers. We've got a lot of places here at Rainbow Baptist Church that you could volunteer to serve. We'll ask you to serve, but there's no place that we're going to require you to serve because that's just not the way that church operates and that's not the way that God typically, typically operates. But there are a lot of opportunities for you to volunteer to serve, but you must volunteer and volunteering also requires commitment. It might require commitment of your time. It might be, require commitment of your convenience. It might require commitment of doing something that you've never done before. I don't know, I've, ne- I've never worked in nursery. I- I've never worked with students. I've never sung in the choir. I've, I've never uh, been an usher. I've never been a greeter. I- I've never served in security. I've never served in any of those capacities. I- but you must volunteer. And that requires commitment. So folks, this morning, I- I'm asking you to-, to ask God to choose to serve. God, where is it you want me to serve? Not if you want me to serve, but where do you want me to serve? God will place you in a place of service. If you are willing, if you are are open, if if you volunteer. But I I also got to tell you this. Sometimes service will require sacrifice. You might be serving in some place that you really didn't want to serve. You might be serving along somebody that you didn't really want to serve alongside of. Maybe it's serving in uh, longer than, than you felt like serving. Maybe it's serving out of your comfort zone. Folks, sometimes service will require sacrifice. But you know what? If we're to to live well and to serve well, the the greatest example of that sacrifice, who sacrificed, I think, just a lot next week, we'll remember that sacrifice. And Jesus sacrificed it all, did he not? He came not to be served, but to serve. To give his life a ransom for many. He gave us the ultimate example of living well and and serving well. Folks, he's called us here to reign with Baptist Church. If this is your church church home, he's called you to to serve well. There are lots of opportunities to serve well. But you know what? Folks often ask about service, and I I tell them, you know, the, the pay is not very good, but the benefits out of this world they really are but you know we get we get to be a blessing and we get to to be blessed in the midst of that notice in verse two what what they said as we wrap up this morning the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in jerusalem in other words those who who were going to go in and and were going to repopulate jerusalem the people all around that they blessed them why man it was a blessing to have people go in and to be able to repopulate the city They, they were blessed right there when we serve, it is a blessing. We may not always be able to see the blessing. We may not even always be able to hear the blessing. It might be years later that we look back and go, man, I, I was really blessed by that. And somebody might years later come and say, man, I, I was really blessed by your service. We'll never know this side of heaven. Well, folks, understand it's a blessing to, in the here and the now. But it's also a blessing from Almighty God. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 often use this at funerals Uh, when john heard uh, the write this blessed are those who die in the lord from now on for their labor is over they get to rest and their works do follow them what does that mean man when we serve one day there's going to be ultimate blessing when we hear those words from the master well done Well done, my good and faithful servant. 
well done. Folks, this morning, as we continue to rebuild the community of faith known as Ramoth Baptist Church, as you rebuild maybe the, the faith within your life, within your family, maybe this morning somebody that does not have faith at all and simply needs to come to Jesus this morning so that you'll truly be able to live well because without Jesus, we simply cannot live well. This morning, what does it mean to, to lead well, to live well, to, to serve well? Ultimately, it's all about Jesus and what he is doing in and through you and me, what he's doing in and through the body of Christ known as Ramoth Baptist Church, working both to work and to will for his good pleasure, for his good purposes. We're not here by accident or coincidence. God has drawn us here with reason and with his purpose to do, to hear, to serve him, to his honor and to his glory. Might we lead well? Might we live well? Might we serve well until that day when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be. But until then, who can we take with us? Until then, who can we bring with us? Until then, who can we lead to know Jesus as Savior and Lord? Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning.